Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, just give it a uh, couple of minutes for more people to join. Right. I, I posted the the meeting the meeting notes on the chat, so feel free to add anything if you'd like to add it. Uh, um, we do have some agenda items today, so I mean, uh, I don't know if we'll get to everything, but uh, you know, uh, if we don't get to it, then we can get to it in the next meetings. So I think. So we got Eric. So thank you, Eric, for um, agreeing to be our scribe. Uh, so we are open to anybody else who wants to be a scribe. So feel free to reach out to any of the chairs if um, if you're interested. Uh, and also, we uh, uh, are open to having somebody else facilitate this meeting. So I've been facilitating this meeting, you know, the, the last few months. But uh, if anybody is interested feel free to reach out to. Uh, so I think with that, uh, we can kind of do a stand up. Uh, uh, we're, we're also open as to what the format of the meeting is. So if you have any suggestions, uh, you know, feel free to bring them up. But with that, we can, we can do a quick stand up. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna go uh, on what I see on my screen on, on, on the, Zoom meeting. So we have Renault. Hello, this is Renault. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Yeah. So so basically the, the format is like if you have any updates, you know, feel free to talk about them or anything you want to talk about in the meeting. Um, you know, and, and then we can talk about it uh, afterwards. Okay. And do you want me to present um the topic that I had in mind? Or that I had it added, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that you added it. Uh, so we have some presentations going on today. So if time okay. allows, uh, I mean, you can you can go and present. Uh, yeah, definitely. Can, yeah, we can do it. And uh, uh, so you want to mention? You want to talk about? You want to mention uh, anything about your your topic? Um, sure. Uh, but it looks. Um, I mean, you mentioned that you had a few items on uh, in the agenda, so I can do that after. Yeah, but it's, I mean, your topic is about uh, device drivers, right? So, it's, yep. or, yeah, okay, so. Um, okay, uh, well, I mean, um, if I have five minutes, then uh, I have a slide deck too, if you, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Let me share quickly my screen. Um, uh, I, I mean, we can do this afterwards. So let's okay. go through it, like, yeah. Uh, Alina? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alina. Um, I, I don't have any updates. I'm just looking forward to today's presentations. Yeah, yeah uh, so the update is that Alina has become our uh, second TOC, so welcome. Oh, um, thank you. And, yeah, and, and glad to be working with you. Likewise. Um, yeah. Hey, Derek. Hey, I don't have any updates, just joining. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric? No updates from my end. Okay. Uh, Fabricio? Hello. So um, here's uh, Fabricio. I uh, work on uh, Google, uh, working on Gvisor. Uh, to uh, you know, bring Gvisor to you know Docker and Kubernetes. 
Uh, this is my, my first time I'm joining, so I'm just here to, you know, watch and see what, what happens in here. Awesome. Uh, Fer Ferju Fer Ferus John, is that, did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's a bit uh, difficult to pronounce. It's just Ferus. It's the first time I'm joining. Uh, I don't have any updates, but I have my colleagues that will be presenting today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Furcat? Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't have updates. Uh, we have the colleagues who will be presenting, so we are joining for that. Okay, great. Uh, Mail? Yes, hello. Um, I'm from the MetalCube project, so I joined to present uh, the MetalCube with Russell. Great. Ray? Hello, no updates for me. Good. Uh, and Russell? Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, as Mel said, I'm, I'm here to, to do a quick presentation on MetalCube, uh, the project that we proposed as a sandbox project. So thanks okay, for having perfect. me. Okay, Awesome. Yeah, so the next item that I have on the agenda is um, the roadmap. Uh, uh, so um, we've been working on this for maybe about a month. So um, uh, we we said that we were going to leave it open for a couple of weeks last time. So um, based on uh, any feedback, and then we said that we, we're going to go back and, and kind of um, start working on some of these items. Uh, I think uh, uh, we've already started working on some of these. Uh, I've, I've been actually reaching out to some of uh, the different related communities. Uh, I've reached out to uh, Kata Containers, Uvisor, Firecracker community, the WebAssembly communities. Uh, WebAssembly has a lot of different projects, so there's uh, multiple communities, but I, I've actually reached out to a few of them in uh, we, we've done some of that work, but there, there was still some, I mean, we want to kind of expand to uh, even a broader scope of, 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 of different projects and, and, and try to identify gaps uh, the, of some of the CNCF projects that exist right now and that, that are not actually filling that gap. Uh, so I, I think, I, Quentin's not around yet, so so maybe uh, we can chat around, or maybe me and Alina can talk about it later and see what some of these items that we want to tackle in the future. Uh, uh, but if you if you have anything that you want to add to that roadmap, uh, please add it, and and then we can uh, you know prioritize basically this, some of the things that we want to do first. Um, I think another one that is was very uh, uh, interesting is is uh, tackling some of the MLOps type of uh, workloads and and tools. Uh, so uh, some of those uh, are not necessarily in the foundation yet. So uh, so we're looking out for maybe projects or technologies that can fill that gap. Uh, anybody has any comments about this uh, uh, roadmap or anything that they want to talk about? Right, so. Oh, I'm just reading the chat right now. So I think, uh, yeah, so um, Renaud, yeah, that, yeah, the stand up is just, you know, to check in and basically just, just talk about whatever you want to talk, uh, talk about later in the meeting. Uh, and yeah, if you, if you um, are an attendee, please add your name to the list. Uh, and also a reminder that uh, we have uh, a repo uh, and then if you are a participant or in any way you want to contribute, you know, please add yourself to the repo. Okay, so with that, I don't think we have anything else. I mean, I'm the one only one speaking so uh, I mean, I just want to leave it open for everybody who wants to say anything. So, um, so feel free to kind of just, you know, participate. Um, so yeah, so with that, uh, I think we will go with the metal cube presentation. So 
Russell and Leo, uh, you know, just take it away. Sure. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again. Um, so we're going to do a, a quick presentation and then, you know, leave it open for questions. Um, yeah. Any discussion, uh, but. Yeah, one, one, one thing that I wanted to mention, sorry, so yeah, is that this meeting is getting recorded. So uh, typically, I think you're going for sandbox. So typically what happens is that, you know, uh, the meeting gets recorded and then uh, later, you know, there's a review by the by the SIG and there's a document that gets maybe uh, posted in the uh, GitHub repo or, or gets uh, checked into the uh, GitHub repo and uh, later the TOC members have a chance to see the presentation and and based on that you know they decide to either sponsor or, uh, or not sponsor the, the project right and then for entry into sandbox uh, the requirements is, is three sponsors in the TOC so yeah so go ahead okay Cool. Um, I yeah we we there's a GitHub pull request against the TOC repo with a, a document that covers a lot of a lot of details about the project and the proposal. Um, so if, if anyone's interested, of course you can check that out afterwards and um, and find out uh, some of that. Of course, we're going to cover a lot of what's in there today. But give me a second here to uh, share the slides here. All right, can you see the uh, slides? Yep. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah, the project's called Metal Cubed. And so the, the high level overview, what is this? This is um, a project to provide Kubernetes native bare metal host management. And so getting into it. So managing bare metal hosts or provisioning and provisioning bare metal hosts, this is not a new problem space, obviously. People have been provisioning bare metal hosts for a while, so why did we want to build another one, or um, or you know, build another approach in this? So starting there, uh, a big one is really the API. The, you know, the, we wanted to explore uh, this this problem space, the problem space of managing bare metal hosts with a declarative API. So what, how what would that look like? We want to have a declarative API for managing bare metal hosts, and so we did that by uh, creating custom resources. On, with Kubernetes uh, to do so. Uh, we also wanted to do something that was designed to run within a Kubernetes cluster, uh, so self-hosted. And uh, uh, one reason for that is, again, you know, managing uh, this software, how you would manage other applications. But uh, uh, really a major one is also the footprint required for uh, a bare metal Kubernetes cluster. We didn't want to have to require uh, something off to the side to, to run the bare metal host provisioning stuff. And part of that is uh, for certain environments, you know, some bare metal Kubernetes cluster use cases would be a large cluster in a data center. Uh, other use cases would be very small clusters, say edge computing use cases, where requiring another host is really unacceptable. So we needed to address this problem of space with something that can be self-hosted in the cluster. And then we also wanted to be able to have a cluster manage its own infrastructure. That was another aspect of this. Um, and that gets into not, we did, what we've built is not just uh, something that manages hosts. We have, a, and I'll get into a bit more detail in a moment, not something that just provisions hosts, but also can, um, we're looking at provisioning Kubernetes clusters. So building on some tooling out of uh, one of the Kubernetes SIGs, the cluster API project integrated with that to allow a cluster to manage its own hosts to become uh, additional nodes in a cluster. So look at so that's that's why we did it. You know that's some of the problems we're trying to solve. Um, so the, the the first major component of this is the bare metal operator, and this this shows some detail, but I'll talk through it. There's a component called the bare metal operator. This bare metal operator is something that runs in a cluster, and it manages a custom resource called the bare metal host. And the bare metal host is the declarative uh, interface for for uh, host for a bare metal host. It has details about the hardware and, and what state you want it to be in. So you, know, you, you update this to describe how you'd like a host to be provisioned. 
and there's some secrets that contain some key details. One of them is the config drive secret. So this is if you've ever used any cloud compute API, there's always a like a, a user data uh, section where you pass data that'll be given to the to the host when it boots up the first time. So a tool like Cloud Init or Ignition can initialize itself on first boot, and we support that that same interface. Um, the way that we do that with bare metal is that we write that information to a a dedicated partition. So then the first time that the new operating system boots up, Cloud Edge or Ignition or whatever tool you'd like, reads that data from that partition and uh, initializes itself. So what does this do? So you know you have this resource and you maybe you update this to say you'd like a host be provisioned. Under the hood, we're making use of Ironic. This is um, hidden as sort of an implementation detail, but we're reusing you know, existing bare metal host provisioning technology here, Ironic. And it knows how to con contact the management controller in the host, boot up a special RAM disk. This RAM disk knows how to download the operating system image that you've decided you'd like provision to a host, write it to the correct disk, um, also write your user data to a, like I said, the config drive partition. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of what we've, what we've built. And quick overview of the API. Th these samples are sort of cut down to fit in a slide, but give, give you an idea of what um, the API looks like. So this is a bare metal host custom resource. In the spec of this, uh, there's some key things. One of them, it's a BMC. So that's information about a management controller on a server. The management controller is what we talk to. It's sort of out of band management for a server. We can use that to do power management to turn the server on and off or controlled boot settings. And so this is key for, for doing management or uh, automatically triggering provisioning of a host. We need to know the MAC address. If we're doing pixie based provisioning, we need to be able to recognize the host when it shows up on the provision network. The consumer ref here, um, you know, this, this interface and this API can be used for for any reason that you want to provision a host, you could just do generic bare metal host provisioning for you know whatever you want. Um, you may it's also designed to be integrated with like layers above it. So for example, if you're using the the cluster API integration, which we'll we'll talk about in a few minutes, then we'll have references references to what you know resource just claimed this bare metal host and what it's provisioning. And so here it's showing a machine from the um, from like say the the cluster API. Uh, group, we would you have a reference to what claim this bare metal host. The image section in this API, this is the operating system image that, that you've said you want provision to that host. And then um, and user data, that's the, the data that you know, something a cloud net or ignition would consume. And so a reference to where that is stored. And the status section of a bare metal host, another thing that we do when we um, bring one of these hosts under management, that RAM disk that we boot up that then knows how to you know, download an, uh, an image and write it to disk. This, this special RAM disk also knows how to inspect the hardware. So it gathers as much detail about the hardware as it can and, and, and sends it back up so we can store it in this resource. And this is uh, heavily uh, condensed. Um, there's quite a bit of hardware details we collect about CPUs, memory, network interfaces, storage, um, and, you know, anything we can find, but this is sort of a sample that shows here a bit of info about CPU, um, a, a little bit of info about a network interface and how much RAM is there. And then the, in the status section, we'll also have the state of provisioning. So in this case, this host has been provisioned. It shows you which image had been provision, provisioned to that host. So that's our declarative um, API for, for managing bare metal hosts. And on top of that, we integrate with the cluster API project. Um, and I will turn that over to uh, Mel to discuss this in a bit more detail. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so basically Cluster API is a, is a project from SIG Cluster Lifecycle. And um, the idea is that you would be able to manage your cl clusters, your Kubernetes clusters declaratively using the Kubernetes um, API. So it, this slide is just like a recap of the Cluster API project. Um, like. The, the, the main idea that is uh, behind this, if you're not yet familiar. Um, so you would have basically a bootstrap cluster or a management cluster that is a Kubernetes cluster, and then the user would be um, interacting uh, with this cluster, like creating CRs um, that would um, actually be representing the target clusters that this user wants to deploy. 
Um, behind the hood, um, under the hood, the, the cluster API actually interacts with different cloud providers. So AWS, Azure, um, uh, like the Google Cloud, like uh, any any kind of cloud providers. So um, we, we we came to think like that. The, um, uh, well, this is this is really cool to be able to to manage the feature, uh, the manage the cluster um, uh, like this, and we wanted to extend it so that we would be able to actually deploy the clusters not on a cloud provider but on actual like bare metal nodes uh, on, on physical hardware. So um, for this. Uh, sorry, can you change the slide, please? Yeah, great, thanks. So um, for this, basically, um, Cluster API defines a set of resources that, for example, is like cluster machine um, that represent the, the, the cluster. Um, and it um, allows like um, providers to, to bring their own objects, like um, an equivalent of each, like, uh, an AWS cluster for a cluster, an AWS machine for a machine, like like um, this is the idea behind the hood. So um, what um, we did then to to integrate with the cluster API is that we um, created those uh, those machines, um, th those um, infrastructure specific um, um, CRDs, like MetalCube machine and MetalCube cluster, with the uh, cluster API provider MetalCube that is actually a set of controllers that reconcile those objects. And the the, the core difference of um, what we've been doing uh, versus like what you can find in AWS or in um, Azure providers is that uh, we do not have, of course, a cloud provider um, API that we could use to start the machines. So um, that's where we like basically integrate with the uh, bare metal operator. Um, that is the core project of, um, of MetalCube. Um, so that then we take care of the provisioning um, of the physical hardware by um, interacting with the uh, bare metal operator API that is actually the bare metal uh, host. So um, this is the uh, logic and uh, like under the this uh, cluster API provider metal cube. If you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this, I just like put here a simple example of what we can achieve. Like is basically you can consider that each of the squares are actually like uh, uh, physical hardware. Um, so we would like start um, a first node with this bootstrap cluster. Um, this can be achieved by uh, using a specific ISO, for example, um, then deploy all cluster API and MetalCube components, and then we will we would be able from there to um, to deploy a target cluster with like for example here master node and the worker node. And once this is done, we can use a cluster API feature um, to move all the CRs to the target cluster, and then remove this um, this bootstrap cluster so that then the target cluster is self managed. So um, but this is currently work in, work in progress in, 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 our, uh, in our project. Yeah, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so some of the future work, um, as he was just saying, the, the cluster API pivoting is on this list. This is where you, know, you have a bootstrap process. You start with this bootstrap cluster, but then moving the components into the resulting cluster. That's particularly relevant for those smaller uh, footprint use cases. Uh, machine re remediation is another one where that's detecting that there's problems on hosts and being able to automatically try to do things to, to repair the cluster that would commonly be just trying to reboot the, reboot hosts to get them to recover um, or taking them out of service if necessary. There's also like uh, uh, more detailed management of bare metal uh, in different ways. So automatically creating RAID volumes during the uh, deployment process is another thing or different firmware aspects. So managing um, BIOS or uh, settings during deployment uh, is another example. So a lot of that, those, those things are just some samples of stuff that's future work or work in progress rather. Um, there's a website, metal3.io, lots of info. Um, there's a, a development environment. If you have a, a host that, um, a single host, we can, set up a, a development test and demo environment using virtual machines. And we, we set up uh, different bits of software so that we manage these virtual machines just as if they were bare metal hosts. Um, and it's great for giving it a shot. 
Um, there's also, there was a KubeCon talk that included some demos. Um, it's linked from the blog on the website, but another resource to find out more if, if you're interested. Um, I wanted to also close with a few sort of community project highlights, a bit of overview. Um, the, the project, we started this um, beginning of last year, so uh, you know, a, a bit over a year now. Uh, we do we do have pr um, production deployments happening this year. Uh, the code it's Apache two licensed. It's all on GitHub. Um, contributors, uh, you know, you should, the, the two there's several repos, but these are the two biggest ones, are the sort of prime ones um, where there's new code being developed, and you can see how many individual people have contributed to each. There's a list of um, companies that that represent the contributors so far. Um, and of course, uh, the two of us here from, from two, of the, two of the companies on that list. The way we communicate as a project in the community, we have a mailing list that we use. We have a channel on the Kubernetes Slack that we use. We hold bi-weekly Zoom meetings uh, to catch up with each other. Um, and where we are on the internet, all, elsewhere, um, we've got our website and a Twitter account, the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel has videos of our, our meetings and also things like demos um, go there as well. So that's just some, some highlights there. And with that, um, thank you very much for your attention and listening. And I wanted to open it up for any, um, any questions or discussion that you may have about what we've done. Yeah, any, I have a few questions, but anybody else, any other questions? Uh, yeah. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> The first, the first question is, uh, so but the, probably uh, the, uh, about the maintenance uh, and the upgrade for the, for the provision hosts. Um, how, is it, how is it different from the initial provisioning? What are, what are the stages? Like if, for example, I want to vertically scale it. How do you, how do you to scale out a cluster or to? to Just to scale up a host, like add CPU or add memory to my, to my, to my bare metal node. I'm sorry. I, I, so you want to, to scale a cluster, or, or are you talking about managing a, something about a specific host? Specific host. Right. Specific, specific host. host. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, you can reprovision a host anytime. Um, so just talking about the bare metal operator part, you know, not the cluster API part. I mean, the, the way the, the way the interface works is you can um, you can have a host provisioned or deprovisioned at any time. Um, you can uh, if you deprovision it, it can also do cleaning. So like it'll go in and wipe the disks for you before it uh, before it you know puts it back into a, sort of in the inventory of available hosts and reprovision and when you reprovision it it's the same process so it takes the the way the yeah, the provisioning approach is it's it's doing whole disk images so it's like any other it's like a cloud image for a, a cloud you take it and it, it's and it wipes the disk so it's not it's there's no no management like inside the operating system kind of thing like it's a whole disk management thing. You know, you're you're the wipe, you're wiping it completely, whether you're provisioning or deprovisioning it. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. And uh, my other question is about the configuration management. So uh, one of the steps was the uh, providing the uh, the image for for the boot. Uh, what if, uh, as a user, I just want to install some tools like ContainerD, for example? Is there is there an interface for for doing that extras? Yeah, there is. So the interface for, um, well, I guess I'll have a two-part answer for that and then see if the mail may have some additional comments. The, at the, the bare metal host API has a, um, a user data interface. So this would be something to be uh, processed by cloud init or, um, or ignition. So you could say, you could include in there, run these commands the first time it boots to install this additional software. So for example, like when I'm doing testing, I, um, I, I will commonly use the generic CentOS cloud image, just like the generic one that's distributed from CentOS, and then um, pass in additional data to say install my SSH key uh, for the user or any software I want to install right away, um, and it supports that interface. So the the data you pass gets written to the to a special partition, and so when that generic cloud image boots up the first time it reads that and, and it will install whatever I ask for. So that's the interface provided at the, the base provisioning layer. And then what you send to it and what you tell it to do would be kind of what you build on top of that. Um, and then our prime use case being provisioning Kubernetes clusters, 
the, the cluster API project that's layered on top, and then our integration with that generates uh, that config using uh, kube ADM, for example, mm -hmm. and, and, and what the configuration it generates there uses that interface so that when we boot up an, an OS image, it runs all the commands that, that were specified to install the right software, run the right things, and, and turn it into a Kubernetes. That software. makes sense. And all the user all the user data that, that is being provided as a first step during the post provisioning, is it stored in the CRD in the cluster, or can it be stored somewhere else and just referenced? Yeah, I think. Um, well, right now we support it being stored in a secret, and then the CRD references that secret, and that has the contents. Uh, I don't. I can't remember if we have any support for storing it somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I. Uh, you could have a secret that just says, like, when the host boots up, tell the host to go pull it from somewhere else, right? I mean, it could be like a stub that just says, go hit this web service to pull down what you're really going to do. That's actually what we do in, um, uh, well, like, so we have this integrated, so I, I work for Red Hat, we have this integrated with, with OpenShift, and that's how that's how a lot of our configs will work, is it'll, it'll be just, it's sort of a stub where it's, uh, you know, that's written there, and the big thing it does is it goes off and talk, contacts a web service to pull down like the real stuff it needs to go do. Um, and that way the contents may change more dynamically. Um, so yeah. that's, that's, kind of, that's, that's what's implemented there. I mean, we could also have a thing. Yeah. But yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, it does. Cool. Thanks for the questions. Appreciate it. Yeah, have some questions. So the, uh, management cluster that's, a requirement, right? So if you um, want to manage uh, some, the same cluster that is the management cluster, would you be, be able to do that with, uh, you know, if you want to add bare metal nodes for that management cluster? Or what is the recommended architecture? Is it recommended to have just the, always that have the, the management cluster or, or uh, can you just have bare metal uh, providers for multiple clusters? Um, so I can maybe answer this one. The, um, so the you can have basically the both both approaches. Um, you could have a management cluster with a bit more like that's a bit more chunky um, that uh, would then be used to deploy multiple target cluster if you wish. Um, but the main goal, our main goal, is to uh, have self-managed target cluster. Uh, in that case, we use on that kind of what you call management cluster or like bootstrap cluster, um, just temporarily to uh, bootstrap the target cluster. And once the target cluster is up and running on a couple of nodes, then we transfer all the like management uh, towards that um, that target cluster. And then we can get rid of uh, what is like this bootstrap cluster or uh, ephemeral node. And in that case, the, the target cluster becomes self-managed. And if we want to add a node like to scale up or um, scale out, or whatever, like we will do it directly by interacting with the the cluster on which we are operating. Got it. And then, and then so this this bootstrap cluster can be something like a mini cube or something like that, or or what? Uh... Um, so it it depends. Um, it if you have access to the proper like uh, networks, um, you could uh, do it with mini cube. Uh, meaning that at the moment there is a requirement that you need to have a layer two connectivity between the bootstrap cluster and the target cluster. Um, we're working on trying to lift this um, by using a specific feature feature of the BMC so that we could do it over a layer three network, um, but it's not the case yet. So you need to have this network uh, requirement fulfilled. So if you have and your like laptop or whatever is connected on the layer two network with your target cluster, then uh, you can use um, that as a as an ephemeral node. But it, usually it's not the case, so that's why like um, in in most of the projects that are using Metal Cube, like for example Airship, um, or what we do in in, in Ericsson, um, we actually create an ISO image that we uh, start on the on the Bootstrap node with everything uh, included in there. So it's a self-contained image that just like start a, a whole like standalone Kubernetes cluster on on one of the uh, hardware, and then we use that to uh, provision the target cluster. And once we have like pivoted uh, the resources so that the target cluster becomes self-managed, we scale up the cluster to take the uh, previous node that we used as bootstrap in use into that target cluster. 
Got it. Yeah. Of course, like the whole flow is still a work in progress. Like <laughs> we're still working on this. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so in terms of the security for the firmware, I mean, if you have any protection there, would would the um, API handle that too? The for the the operator, the the metal cube operator would handle like if you if there's some sort of a password or something that talks to the IPMI modules or something on yeah. On the yeah. Yeah. There's different management controller um, protocol IPMI being sort of the the least common denominator one, um, but there's more moving more towards Redfish. That's a newer standard. Uh, and then there's all, also a lot of vendor specific interfaces that, um, that we can support and all of them have authentication um, and we make use of it. You store the authentication details in a secret and then reference, it, reference that secret from the bare metal host object. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you have to provide those credentials. I mean, you're basic when you enroll a host into management in this, it's, you know, we have, have complete control over the host. Um, so, you, you know, you have to lock down access to these, to this, to this API to, of course, but the, um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was just thinking more about uh, uh, some of these newer things like uh, Nitro from AWS and would they have these enclaves on, on the machines where, where you know, only if you have a specific fingerprint, you, you're the only one who can access that machine or something. So uh, it's preventing people from accessing your the lowest level of your infrastructure, basically your firmware, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, you know, somebody or a hacker can get into your lowest part of your infrastructure, they can basically gain access to everything, right? So, uh, so and I was just thinking about how Metal Cube will interact with, with these, uh, you know, technologies, right? So, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the extent of the authentication we can support right now is a username and password um, to the to the management controller and anything more sophisticated you can't do with it yet. Uh, I don't. I'm not aware of anyone who's exploring any any of the more sophisticated access control. Um, that's what we do right now. And then the use of that, um, you know, you typically put that on an isolated network. You might, you might put that on a network that you, that's not reach. You would ideally put that on a network that's not reachable by any of your workloads on the cluster, for example. Yeah. Lock that down as well. Um, and then on the components, you have two components. You have the the cluster API component, and you also have the the con the operator, right? So that uh, those two components are part of the project, or or they're like separate. Because uh, uh, I, th I think the cluster API component is it more related to the, the, the cluster API, the Kubernetes cluster API, or is it how, is that bundled yeah. together? So okay, so the, yeah, those are the two. Um, so if you were to look at our GitHub, you'll see that both of there's a repository for each of those components, and then there's another one that sets up like our development and test environment, and then there's others that are like container images and that sort of thing. But those two components. Are um, yeah, they're, they're they're standalone things. They're standalone Kubernetes controllers that that you'd run in your cluster. Um, the first one, the bare metal operator, is very focused on provisioning bare metal hosts, but it's a, it's sort of a it's a more generic bare metal host provisioning interface. So you can provision you know Ubuntu hosts or whatever operating system of choice hosts for any purpose using that interface. The cluster API integration is a layer on top that that then take some of the more generic cluster API controllers, but, um, but provide like that's a, they have generic controllers and then you have to integrate it with any type of infrastructure platform. And that's what we provide here. And since that's so tightly related and um, integrated with the, our bare metal operator controller, you know, we, we have them under our same project umbrella. So those are the two key things, but they can, you don't have to, you don't have to use both. You could use just the bare metal operator, for example. Um, but of course the, uh, the cluster API thing is a popular thing you use on top of it. Right, because I mean, some people just want to provision bare metal hosts. They don't want to bootstrap yeah. Kubernetes cluster, right? So, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's that's why they're that's why they're architecturally separate because um, that's a problem to solve on its own for you know not specifying 
what you're provisioning or for what purpose. And then, um, and if you happen to be provisioning Kubernetes clusters, that's of interest to us and we have an additional component you can use for that. Uh, yeah, one more question. So what is the component that uses OpenStack Ironic? Is that the... Uh... Yeah, Ironic is, um, so, you know, we have, we built the API um, and the behavior we want is the declarative interface to, to do the lower level provisioning aspects. We, we integrated Ironic. It's um, like within the code, there's this is sort of like a plugin layer where you can plug in different provisioning systems that can fulfill a set of needed operations. Ironic is where we started. We had a lot of experience with it. It's quite, um, has a ton of features. It knows how to talk to a bunch of different interfaces, including a number of virtual um, vendor specific ones. It's got a pretty a, a good community with, um, with um, participation from a lot of hardware vendors. So it just got us, it got us going pretty quickly. Uh, architecturally though, like it's kind of a, we run it inside, um, maybe, you know, to leave it open to exploring um, either I'll, different options or, 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 or performing certain operations with something else, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, we use Ironic and we typically uh, will have it deployed in the cluster as well, or with, even within the same pod. Uh, yeah, uh, I could talk more about how, how we use it. We use it in a kind of a, a pretty unique way, but um, that's right, that's a, a key component we depend on. Thank you. Any, anybody has any other questions? So, so yeah, would like this to become interactive. So if yeah, this, so this is Eric. I had a couple of questions, and um, I apologize if this might have already been answered. But I just wanted to understand that the clusters you guys are provisioning are full-on bare metal hosts, right? It's nothing like VMs or uh, I don't know. I just wanted to guess, clarify if you guys did integrate with other configuration management tools like Chef and Puppet, or is it just more so strictly speaking bare metal? Um, it, yeah, I mean, our, our use case is, is full bare metal hosts, you know, things that you take, you know, you put in, put in a rack and, um, and have, you know, physical access to that. That's, that's our primary use case. We have some development environment stuff that's based on virtual machines. Um, but like the, the, the project, the, the whole point, the whole point of it is, is bare metal hosts for on-premise, uh, use cases. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned also using ISO images. So I was just wondering if, uh, I guess, the OS is um, baked in or if there's a desire to make that, I guess, pluggable. It seems like with Kubernetes, especially, you have, you know, specific OSs that are very much trimmed down. So I'm wondering if there's, I guess, one preferable um, metal, I guess, OS. Um, I imagine sometimes with vendors, you know, especially on the hardware side, you run into a lot of challenges. So just curious to see if there's, you know, an area there with drivers or, yeah, uh, I guess, certain uh, vendors become problematic. In terms of um, so operating systems, at the bare metal host provisioning layer, it's completely operating system agnostic. You just need to be able to point it to a disk image, and that could have any operating system in it. I mean, it needs to be compatible with the hardware you're trying to deploy it to, but um, it doesn't really care. Um, now, once we try to reboot and the host tries to boot off the image you gave it, I mean, if you gave it something bogus, then you know, we can't fix that. But um, in any case, it's, it's operating system agnostic. Now, as you get higher up the stack and you start trying to automate doing something with the host, like try, you need to start, um, say, when we get to the case of trying to provision Kubernetes clusters, then uh, that, that starts to depend on which operating system you're, you're running on. Um, I think. If I may add yeah. there, like, um, so in the um, development environment that uh, we have, we are able to provide clusters um, uh, provision clusters with both CentOS and Ubuntu uh, images. And internally in Ericsson, we have also done it with SLES. So it basically, it really just depends on um, how you install the different components that are needed, like kubeadm, kubelet, and um, uh, Docker, or whatever C um, CRI that you're using. Um, so it can be, it can basically run pretty much on any OS. Uh, then of course, some will be better adapted to some hardware than others, but then that's the choice of the, of the user. Like um, it's just about providing a disk image of that specific OS and then like um, uh, changing a bit the, the installation parts um, in, in cluster API, like what executable you install and how you, you, you deploy them. We've also used um, uh, RHEL and, and CoreOS with the other ones that, that we used 
heavily in, in the, our use. That probably covers all the ones that we've been trying. Thank you. Sure, thanks for the questions. Uh, so in terms of the users that are trying this, or uh, you, you mentioned there's, uh, uh, do you have some that are deploying right now? Or I think that's some of the questions that come usually from the TOC that, uh, that they sure. want to see adopters or kind of early adopters initially. So yeah, so I mean, so I, I can, I'll, I'll speak and then I'll have uh, Mail to, to cover um, his, his part of this too. So at Red Hat, we, we're, we've adopted this to, to be um, part of our bare metal solution for, for OpenShift. So optionally being able to automate provisioning of bare metal um, cluster, bare metal Kubernetes clusters with our with OpenShift. Um, and we're working with customers right now to, to use this for production de deployments. Um, and so that, that's, that's our, our take. I can't call out specific customer names. Um, I can just say that we are working with some. With a, with a number of customers, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I can also probably add that, um, well, we are in Ericsson, of course, like using this internally, but then on top of that, there is an, um, project, a project called Airship that is led by AT&T um, that is making a full use of, um, of Metal Cube uh, to deploy on bare metal. So the, the goal of that Airship project that is under the OpenStack umbrella um, is to uh, deploy an OpenStack cluster uh, uh, for uh, uh, 5G uh, networks. Um, and, and they are using uh, Metal Cube uh, under the hood. Got it. Cool. Any more questions? Any any ideas? Any questions? Any uh, comments? All right, so it sounds like uh, no more questions. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for, for your presentation, that was great. Um, so I think the next steps is uh, for the sector review and um, I, I need to go back and, and figure out what the process is. I mean, it's constantly changing as far as sandbox. So uh, typically I think there will be uh, some documentation from the project that they would submit or with a with, uh, set, set of items uh, and, and then the, the SIG would actually write uh, uh, official recommendation to the TOC and then from there the, it, it would be up to uh, the TOC if it gets enough uh, sponsors to become a sandbox project. All right, well, thanks again for hearing us out. Appreciate it. Yep. All right, so we have a, I think we have one more, more, one more item from Renault. Uh, do you want to talk about your presentation? Or just... uh, give me a quick second to um, share my screen. Um, I have some, I have shared the slides in the um, issue. Um, quick note, they're pretty obscure. Um, I'll try to change them as time goes on. Um, so my name is Renaud. I work at NVIDIA. I'm a software engineer there. Um, I wanted to present about the container device interface. Um, I'll give you some background on device support. Um, I'll give you some use cases, and then uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about uh, what is container device interface. Um, um, who, who does it come from? Um, just it's not just NVIDIA, um, and um, I mean, how we thought about it, uh, but we're, we're definitely open to rethink that. Um, very quickly, I'm part of the group that originally built the device plugin interface in Kubernetes. I maintain in a device plugin for Kubernetes, I maintain a stack to support devices in different runtimes, whether it's Docker, Podman, Singularity. I've interacted with many runtimes and uh, more recently I've been working on the OCI hooks to help device support in um, um, 
So I think the, the first point that most people uh, want to address is uh, why is it that um, Docker run, Podman run, or, or basically why is it that this option dash dash device, um, dev my device node is not sufficient? This is the example for that. Um, and um, in, in the past and even today, um, enabling a container to be device aware is, is, is as, or used to be as simple as just exposing a device node in the container. And dash dash device actually use, uh, works pretty well uh, for, for, for a wide range of devices that are pretty simple. Um, as um, you go in more complex devices, um, it happens that more things are needed. Um, for the simple use case would be that um, you actually need to expose more device nodes. Um, you might need to expose IPCs, um, for example, XORG or um, vendor specific IPCs. Um, you might need to expose files from the runtime namespace or even change some protocol entries. Um, or more generally, you might want to perform compatibility checks. Is this container going to run with this device? Um, you might want to perform some runtime specific operations. Um, what you do in a Linux container uh, might be very different than what you do on a VM um, container runtime. Or even you might want to perform some device specific operations. Um, I think um, if you look a bit at um, some of the devices, um, some of the third party device um, support that you have out there for, 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 for devices, it is a very fragmented space. Kubernetes supports device plugin, Docker has an entry plugin mechanism, Podman has a concept of hooks. Um, that allow you to run OCI hooks on a container. GnomeNet has a concept of device plugin, but it's different from the Kubernetes device plugin. Singularity has a concept of plugin. Singularity is an HPC runtime, if you're not familiar with it. And you could go on with uh, many different runtimes. Uh, LXC also has a concept of plugin. So why is there a need for a specification? Um, generally, the user experience is not very consistent. Uh, you, you won't even get the same user experience um, if you were using Docker and Kubernetes that uses Docker. Um, so you can't get the same user experience between the runtime and the orchestrator, even though they're using the same runtime. Uh, plugins can be moved from one runtime to another, um, even when it intuitively sh should be very straightforward. For example, having a plugin in Docker and having a plugin in Podman is is not something that can be easily done. Um, and as vendors, we end up either in maintainability hell, um, spending time on surfacing a feature to different runtimes, um, resorting to hacks. Um, I'll present some of the use cases from different vendors in the next slide, uh, where um, some people, or at least for example, for NVIDIA, uh, we ended up writing a um, run C shim so that we uh, basically um, hijack the OCI spec. Well, hijack is not really the word, but when Docker passes the OCI spec to run C, we would um, inject uh, our hooks in that spec. Uh, or uh, for other vendors, uh, what that means is that um, you just exclude runtimes from your platform. Um, so going into some of the use cases, um, I'm going to go with. Um, I'm going to start with a simple one with uh, Intel FPGA. Um, I've gathered some of these, uh, at least from Intel specifically. I've gathered that from the conversation that we were having at KubeCon US, um, where um, generally some of the operations that they need are, that they need are pretty static. Basically, they need to mount um, other device nodes and they need to reconfigure the FPGA with the correct function. Um, one of the requirement me meaning that they don't want the container to be reconfiguring the FPGA uh, because that would be uh, a security risk for them. Um, and uh, from what I've gathered, they currently mostly use Cryo and Kubernetes to inject OCI hooks, and I don't think they have a runtime um, or runtime specific mechanism to do that for Docker, um, other than just passing the right arguments on the command. Uh, Mellanox is another use case. Um, it's a it's a 
um, it's a specific use case because it's it's actually a niche, um, but there is a device component in there um, where um, Melanox so provides basically um, Ethernet and Infiniband makes um, that are used in many data centers um, for high performance clusters. Um, we use that, for example, in deep learning. Um, they have a specific interesting use case um, where they definitely need to mount device nodes, um, but they also need to mount um, user libraries. So um, their specific use case is when you install the Melanox driver, the Melanox driver is also going to install user line components libraries. Um, and because they don't provide backwards compatibility guarantee, when they um, give you um, the Melanox driver 1.0, you can only use um, the libraries 1.0 to talk to the driver 1.0. So there's no 1. Dot, um, they, they don't have sender um, versioning. So um, but the, the example would be that in their case, the next version that they would provide is 2.0. And so what that means is you can't put the 1.0 libraries in a container uh, because if you were to move that container to another machine that had 2.0, um, well, that container wouldn't run, or the the calls that you would make in the libraries would fail uh, on the driver. Um, another use case, which I'm definitely more familiar with, is the NVIDIA use case, uh, where um, we provide a a stack to uh, help with GP integration. And there's there's a couple of things that we need to do. For example, mount device nodes. Uh, mount user line libraries, we have the same problem um, as Malinux where we don't provide any guarantees. And so um, for a container to be GPU where we need to mount libraries um, that were installed with the driver from the host. Uh, we need to mount some Unix sockets for um, specific um, um, components. Um, so persistency being um, this daemon that keeps the driver loaded at all times, uh, and PSXOR. Uh, we need to update the procfs entries so for example let's say a user wanted to only show one gpu out of the uh, out of the eight gpus that he or she has on the machine uh, we would need to um, hide the gpus that are available in the procfs the other gpus and we might want to perform compatibility checks between the container and the gpu um, for example um, we have many generations of gpus and um, if you compile a code or a container for a specific a GP architecture, you might not want uh, your code to run another GP architecture uh, because you end up uh, taking a performance increase. Um, Bruno, yep. sorry to interrupt. Uh, it's just a time check. Uh, we're almost uh, at the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of everybody's uh, time. So, uh, do you want to continue with this uh, now or for the folks who want to stay around a little bit longer or do you want to kind of uh, take the discussion uh, into the next meeting? Um, I'm happy to take the discussion in the next meeting or continue if people want to stay around. Um, I think I've given the gist of the use case just to um, basically, the next few slides are mainly about just presenting the solution that we came up with. Um, so depending on what people want to do, I'm happy to either continue or wait until the next meeting. Uh, I think, it, yeah, it's, it's your call mostly, I think. Uh, um, maybe I recommend, you know, talking uh, briefly and uh, talking about it briefly in the next meeting and, and then, uh, then we can jump into maybe a discussion or something right, for a few minutes, right? So. Uh, because that, 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 that you know, you'll get more uh, eyeballs uh, during the, yeah. the meeting time. So definitely. So okay, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk about it in the next meeting. In that case, um, awesome. So any last minute questions from anybody here that that about this topic um, before you know we just uh, end the meeting. Okay, so yeah, so thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you next time. And and then and then Renaud, if you want to follow up with me, anything, feel free to uh, ping me on on Slack as well. Sure. Um, 
I think just generally I'm trying to get some eyeballs on this and figure out if this fits in the runtime, uh, SIG runtime um, scope. From what you've told me, it looks like um, it, 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 seems, it seems like it fits the scope. Yeah, it, I think it's, it's, it's relevant. And uh, I, as if it's not Kubernetes specific, you know, and it's more around workloads and how you, you can use it to fil facilitate workloads, then it is more of a fit in SIG runtime than Kubernetes. But if it is something that is, uh, has to be, uh, you know, uh, defined and, and implemented at, at the Kubernetes level, it will be more of a fit in Kubernetes. But then, yeah, and, then, and we talked about it in, before. And so, you know, like, yeah. you can so, follow so up. It's definitely not Kubernetes specific. Um, yeah. And there are Kubernetes implications, um, but if this is more of a runtime um, component. Got it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe. Uh, stay, stay at home and don't, don't go out too much. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank See you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.